Hello, no, Hello. We are here, as promised earlier, we are here live with Nick Ponder, our author, for the live reading session. Hello, Nick. Good morning from me. Good afternoon to you. Thank you. So without any further delay, we'll move on to Nick and let the reading begin. Let's do it. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, Nigra. You're welcome. So good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Nick B. Ponta. I'm the author of Connor Jackson and the Memory Thieves, and I'm delighted, delighted. to be able to come to you today to do a, a short reading and introduce my book. And let's have a little bit of fun, I think. And I'm going to get straight into action. But first, before I begin, um, I'm going to do the reading today. I'm going to choose little pieces. And I'm going to, one, introduce the protagonist, Connor Jackson. All books need a protagonist. All books, I think, need a location. So I would describe to you the Mole Hamptons, which is my fictional place. I've got the Khan family. Yes, I used to live in Pakistan, if you weren't aware. So part of my lovely time in Pakistan has also been uh, brought into this book. Some characters, Felicity Forsyth Twyk and Jemima Kingston and Cromwell, who's a dog. Also, fantasy and a funny scene. I think we should get going. So, before I started writing, I didn't have to wear glasses. I do now. So, I'm going to start with describing this scene on the front cover of Connor Jackson finding something in his garden. Rather strange. So, let's go. My bedroom window overlooked the garden and, like my house, I didn't put too much effort into making it look nice. I had very little interest in nice flowers, letting the plants in my garden naturally take over. Unlike my neighbour, Mr Lawnsworthy. I'll tell you about him later. But I did at least keep it tidy. In June, my garden was in full bloom, accompanied by the twittering of birds and the early morning dew sparkling in the first rays of the sun. But something was different today. And the dew wasn't the only thing sparkling in the sun. I wasn't yet sure, but I could sense something was out of place. And there it was. Right in the middle of my lawn was a big mound. I rubbed my eyes, squinted, and focused on the mound again. I don't know if I was imagining it, but I had the feeling that there was something like a small angular pipe protruding out of the top of the mound, just like a submarine's periscope. Hmm. It appeared to be slowly turning 360 degrees and suddenly reflected in the sunlight. It was hard to see exactly what it was from this distance, but something was definitely there. So I decided to have a look and put on my dark red dressing gown. I walked down my creaky wooden staircase into the kitchen and opened the door which led directly into the backyard. Right in the middle of the lawn was a huge mound of earth, dark brown, fresh, and still steaming in the sun. Ah, damn moles, I cursed under my breath. I didn't really have anything against moles, not being the keenest gardener, but this was just too much. In the past, I had never had too many molehills, just now and then. But this one, well, this one was like the Taj Mahal of the mole world. It must have taken them the whole night to build it. Why me? Why my garden? I actually didn't know too much about moles. Only what most people know. They are blind, dig tunnels, and leave their annoying earth hills in our gardens. But I must admit, I had never seen a mole in my entire life. It was then that I saw it again. Something glinted in the sun at the top of the mole hill. But this time I was closer. Was that a piece of white metal at the top? I quickened my pace towards the mole hill. Just at that moment, the object, which I had assumed was a type of periscope, turned directly towards me and stopped. So did I. Then the top of this huge molehill fell away and an object fell out, rolled down the side, leaving the top of the molehill open and exposed. The moles must have sensed that I was approaching and decided to dash for cover. But what was with these strange objects? With a sense of trepidation, I slowly walked the remaining metres across the lawn. Oh my goodness, the molehill nearly came up as far as my knee. Unbelievable. I heard molehills were good for aeration, but my garden was just fine and didn't need 
any extra assistance from these moles, a closer look revealed an upside down glass jar lying halfway down the mound. What on earth? I mumbled to myself. This was most strange. I stooped down and carefully picked it up. It was a small glass jar with a white metal lid, just like a jam jar. The glass was dirty, dusty, and one third of it was filled with the creamy white sort of liquid. There was a plaster stuck directly on the outside of the glass with a name written on it, Professor Wingnut. This really was most strange indeed. Where had this come from? Had somebody been snooping around in my garden last night? Maybe thieves but surely not in our sleepy, serene village of Lower Molehampton. The last reported burglary was five years ago, when unknown assailants broke into Mr Tinker's ironmonger store and stole his whole supply of jam jars. In the same week, the glass jam jar factory in Lower Molehampton was also robbed of its entire supply of jam jars. It had the whole village in an uproar, and Sergeant Dawson had never found out who the robbers were. I looked at the jar in my hand, then at the molehill, and contemplated the connection between the two events. Don't be silly, Connor, I said to myself. What have they got to do with each other? It must be a coincidence. So, Ikra, that is the end of my first short reading. Over to, over to you in the television studio. Okay, so we have our students from Pakistan and we have students from Turkey. Hello, Flippity Sisters. Hello. Hello. Okay, now they will be the one who is going to ask you questions. And I also want the students who's watching from there, I want you guys to ask even questions. So come on, uh, Lenny, what do you have to say? Um... I don't really have a question right now. Do you have any curiosity how do the writers write or what do they think of it? Um. Okay, let me ask Aksa. Aksa, do you have a question? Yes. For our author? Yes. So, when did you decide to become an author? Yes, that because is neither a very... also wants to become an author. You want to become an author too. That's excellent. I, I have to admit, I didn't have this feeling at a young age. It happened about seven or eight years ago when suddenly I had the feeling inside me that I wanted to write. I wasn't sure at the time what I wanted to write about, but I suddenly had that feeling that I wanted to do it. Um, I was always very good at English in school and creative, but I never knew what was inside me until I started to write. And then it all came out. So for me, it was much later in life, much later. But what inspired you? Um, for, about the character, what inspired you to write for, for this, this For this story, it's easy for me to answer. I was sitting in my garden one evening, and my garden was destroyed by molehills. And I sat there looking at them rather annoyed, thinking, what are they doing there? Why do they need so much space? Why are they digging? And then the idea came to me, there must be a secret world down there. And that's what inspired me to write this story. That sounds perfect. Now let's Nick move on to your next reading. Okay, as I said, the um, a, a good story is. I mean, we've we've got the protagonist. We've got Connor Jackson, and I mentioned in the first reading that he lives in a place called Lower Molehampton. And just for everybody to know, you've got Lower Molehampton, Upper Molehampton, and the River Angler in between. And I'm now going to read a short scene describing the Molehamptons. So, reading glasses back on. Page 31, so. Chapter two, number three, Trout Lane. Trout Lane is at the top of lower, top end of Lower Molehampton and sits on top of a hill, offering a perfect view of the whole area and surrounding streets. From my bedroom window, I have the view that I so love. A clear view of the river Angler slowly meandering down the lush, steep-sided valley. In fact, I have a crow's nest view of the whole valley. Not only can I see the river, but I have a clear view over Lower Molehampton itself, with its jam jar glass factory, meat processing plant, 
campsite and football pitch on my side, and Upper Molehampton with its castle ruin on the other side. I am sure that in its day the ruin would have imposed its control up and down the river. I can hear the car ferry clanking its way across the river on a steel cable, as the Molehamptons no longer have a bridge. The Molehamptons are situated on a large sweeping bend in the river. Upper Molehampton is on the outside bend, where the river is at its fastest, and over the years has carved out, carved out a steep side in the valley, with a very narrow floor. Lower Molehampton is on the inside of the bend, where the river is at its slowest, and has created a wide floodplain over the years. As a result, Upper Molehampton is squeezed into a narrow stretch along the river and spread out up the hill to the castle ruin. Lower Molehampton has the freedom of the floodplain and has, over the years, formed into a circular looking town. Looking up the valley, away from the towns and ruin, I can see Mr Rye's old stone farmhouse. It is on my side of the river and sits in the plain a few hundred metres from the river. At the same height as the farmhouse, is a large majestic willow tree. Bending over the river like an old school headmaster, imposing his will on a student. On this particular day, I could just make out a dog running around Mr. Rye's fields, barking loudly. I always wondered what it was like to be a dog. I mean, they really didn't have to do much and spent most of the day dozing around. In a way, I was quite jealous because dogs didn't have to go to work do the shopping, do the cleaning and many other things. In fact, everything was done for them. Many years ago, Upper and Lower Moldhampton were united, but fierce rivalry between the villages led to the two sides of the river going their own way. Visitors today cannot see the rivalry, but for those living in the Moldhamptons, it has always been just simmering below the surface. It all stems from the way the two sides of the river developed over the years. According to local folklore, there was once an all-powerful and ruthless lord who lived in the castle and had total domination over the whole area. His family lived on the side which is now Upper Molehampton, and the servants and workers who tended his estate lived on the other side of the river, what is now Lower Molehampton. The noble family fell from grace and the castle fell into ruin. The mayoress of Upper Molehampton, Felicity Forsyth Twyke, not well known for her scruples, claims to be from the same stock as the noble family, through many distant relatives. Not only is she the mayoress, but also the owner of the meat processing plant in Lower Molehampton. She supplies the whole region with meat and brokers, no competition. So Ikra, back into the television studio in Karachi, over to you for second reading done. Oh, great. I love questions. I love the location that you have described yeah. in the book. Um, have you ever been to these Actually, places? Actually, it's, um, it's all fiction. Um, I made these villages up. So the name Upper Molehampton and Lower Molehampton doesn't exist. But I must say, when I wrote my book, I did go to a place which looks very similar in Germany, and I described it from there sitting in a tent camping. So it's based on a place, but I changed it and put fictional names in it. Okay? Okay. Ikra, your microphone. <laughs> okay. Now we have one, one, one message from a student. I love your reading. I saw that when I was and reading. <laughs> Yes, and you are one of the best authors. Wow. So what decide, how did you, you know, decide to become an author? Did you always wanted to be an author? Um, so I'll just, uh, um, first, Wali Wajid, thank you very much for these lovely comments. I saw them whilst I, whilst I was reading, but obviously couldn't comment, but thank you very much. Yes. Did I always want to become an author? Um, from a young age, no. I, I was then, had uh, a, a long career and... In my, I was so busy in my career that I didn't think of writing. This was really something that came in the last seven, eight years. And I never knew what was inside me. It's just burst out. And I, I, I must have had it all the time, but never knew it was there. Okay, one question we have from Sarah Junaid. Can you please share some tips to write the story? 
Ooh, now that is a good question and a difficult question. Um, I can only really talk from my perspective of how I did it, but my I, I go through a few phases. I go through a thinking phase, and I'm actually a teacher. I teach English, and I when I drive around, and I usually do a lot of driving, I have lots of time to think, and I have notebooks in my car, in my rucksack, at home. I have my smartphone, and if I have an idea, I just write it down. And th this is really my uh, the fantasy side coming out. But the, of course, all my ideas are in no particular order. So I believe you must have a thinking phase and you have to be in a place where it inspires you to think. Then, of course, once you stop thinking and you've got your rough plan, you, you can't just start writing. Some people may be able to do it. I couldn't. I needed to plan it. And I then got all of my ideas together. And a little bit like a film script, I started putting them together in some sort of order, taking things out, changing things until I was happy that my plan worked. And then I started writing. So you need space and time to think and you need to plan your story. A story must have a beginning and an end. There should be character development and many other things. Maybe you'll hear more today. So, Sarah, wow. I hope I answered your question. I think really, I think you answered my question because my daughter wants to write here and I'm sure many more students want to write a story. I'm sure. Uh, this is Aman. He's, uh, he likes your story so far. He's our student. He's from grade one. Okay. And Zahra is saying a very interesting story. Nice. That makes me very happy. I'm glad you all like it. Yes, we like it. So let's um, move on to our next part. Okay. Now, the next part, as you all know, or maybe you picked up, I actually lived in Pakistan for four years in Islamabad. And I spent time in Lahore, a little bit of time in Karachi, Peshawar, Quetta. So I traveled around the country. I even went to Nagaparbat, which was fantastic. Now, of course, because I'm writing, something from Pakistan had to go into my story. This is a very short scene of uh, the Khan family, which will appear, and this family will appear in all of my books. There are four stories planned, by the way. Oh, we are going to wait for it. So here we go, the Khans. Two men were in a room devoid of any sort of decoration. Just a desk, two chairs, and a small rectangular rug on the floor. On the desk, a radio and a headset. The room had a rich smell of curry, maybe Lahori handy, and spices about it. One of the men was sitting on the floor in the corner, holding prayer beads in his hand whilst looking devoutly at the floor, his face deep in concentration. He was dressed in an immaculately clean and well-pressed white robe, had a long jet black beard with dark and menacing eyes. The other man, of similar appearance to his colleague, was on a chair about one metre from the window. The window was partially closed by curtains to make sure nobody from the outside could see the powerful camera and microphone. The man was totally focused on the house, the target house, well lit by the streetlights and today's full moon. Their radio crackled into life. <laughs> Hello, Golf One. This is Foxtrot 8. Over. The man on the floor jolted up from his sitting position, sprung towards the radio and put the headphones on. Assalamu alaikum. This is Golf One. Send. Over. Golf One. Move on the asset now. Implement Plan H. Over. Foxtrot 8. Confirm. Inshallah. Golf One. This is Foxtrot 8. Out. Next short scene, in the same street. In another house, two overweight men in dirty red tracksuits looked like they had not washed in an age. An old battered couch, a fridge and a desk with a radio were the only items in the stuffy room. It smelled of sweat and stale air. One of the men had his hand in a big bag of crisps and stuffed handfuls of them into his mouth with loud crunching noises with most of the crisps landing on his fat belly. The other man sat by the window, slurping from a drinks can, his face deep in concentration, looking at the house. Protected from view, with old dirty lace curtains, were his tools, a large camera on a tripod and listening equipment. The target house was well lit by the streetlights and today's full moon. Their radio burst into action. 
Hello, Victor 3. Hello, Victor 3. This is Mike 1. Come in. Come in. Over. The man dropped the bag of crisps on the floor with a scowl of discontent, waddled over to the radio and donned the headphones. What? Your target is moving. Move, move, move. Over. Uh, moving now. Ikra, back to television studio at Lincoln Method in Karachi. Um, it's interesting to know that you lived in Pakistan for four years. Which city did you like and why did that you That is like? an excellent question. Um, I lived in Islamabad, but a lot of people say Islamabad is not really Pakistan. They say Ralpindi is. My favorite city, I have to say, was Lahore. Um, sorry, Karachi, but I, I only went to Karachi two times, so I didn't really get to know it very well. But I spent a lot of time in Lahore, and I love the city especially the old city, Bajahi Mosque, um, and uh, all of that part. I, I really, really liked it. Okay. I have another question. Is your main character um, inspired by someone you know, or is it completely fictional? Completely fictional. Although some people ask me if I am Connor Jackson. No comment. I wonder. <laughs> but I write, I write the story. When Connor Jackson is describing things, I write it in the first person. So. OK. We have one question. How can we make our story interesting to catch the reader's attention? OK, that's a very good question. Um, you have to have a good plot. Um, and that's why it's part of the planning. The plot must be planned to give the reader the feeling that something else is coming. So you need suspense in your writing and there of course I, I don't know whether i'll have time today to maybe go into some part of how to build up some suspense but you need to, to learn some tactics of building up suspense don't give the reader everything because you know when you watch a film you have your eyes and you can see everything so nobody needs to describe things but when you're writing you have to do it differently so the reader can imagine but if you give the reader too much information then maybe you give them too many answers so to catch the reader's attention, maybe you just need to give little bits and let the reader decide themselves. But it's a very careful balancing act to make. OK, you wanted to ask something? Uh, which spot is interesting to write a story? Oh, where? Yes, Did which spot is the best to write a story? Well, for me, I love being outside. And when I wrote Connor Jackson and the Memory Thieves, most of it was written on a tent next to a river and a castle ruin, which looks very much similar to the place I mentioned in my book, also in the mountains in Central Europe. Um, book number two is finished, but hasn't been submitted yet. And the second half of that is in Thailand. And I actually wrote it in situation in Thailand. So I think the best place is for you to be outdoors. To let uh, for me completely. Work. Yeah, but, but also, for example, when I describe, for example, the Mole Hamptons, I was actually in the place describing it there live. And in, in Bangkok, I was there describing it live. So yeah, obviously so the fantasy the world, I couldn't do. How many years did it take you to write Connor Jackson and the Memory Thieves? If we include from the first thought I had to the book coming out last year, seven years. But I do have a job as well. I, I do work as well. So <laughs> book number two is much quicker. Okay. Now we have a question from our student. What is the difference between narrative and account writing? I would say narrative writing is when you are really describing something, what you see. I mean, you're narrating a story. Um, and that's why I, I mainly wrote it in the, in the first person of Connor Jackson. So it's like he's narrating the story. And I thought that was a very nice style to write it in because... Um, it gives the reader the feeling that somebody's reading the book to them. And I think that's maybe a nice word because every book is different and every writer has a slightly different style. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other. Yes, certainly. Okay, Sarah Donate says, this is an interesting story. And we have a question from Sana Budwani. Can you share some interesting storytelling ideas for pre-primary students because she's a teacher? Ah, excellent, yeah. Um, Sana, ni nice to hear you. Thank you for your question. Um, obviously, we can go into many parts of the book. If we focus on the descript descriptive parts of the book, for example, the way I describe the Mole Hamptons or other parts in the book, 
um, get gets your students to sit somewhere and try to describe what's around them so that other people who read it can close their eyes maybe or listen to it and really try to picture it. Um, the test for me was this front cover. A friend of mine painted it or drew it. And when I asked her to do it, she said, don't describe it to me. Give me the text from your book and I will draw it from your description. And she said, if the picture is exactly how you imagine it to be, then you've done a good job. And the picture was exactly as I imagined it to be. So, um, Sana, I hope that is a good tip for one element of storytelling. Yes. Now we have a question from Zara. How to write a suspense story? How to write a suspense story? Um, don't give everything away at the beginning. Um, <laughs> you, you, you need cliffhangers. <laughs> you need cliffhangers. I know the, the writer wants to tell a story, but you need to keep your keep, keep calm. And but you need to leave little breadcrumbs at the beginning of the story. Um, one of the advantages I've got in my book, I write in short scenes, um, which is so I keep on changing. And sometimes I write the same scene from a different angle. Um, so. Lots of little breadcrumbs, but you have to be very careful about how you leave your breadcrumbs. You don't want to give too much away, but you want to leave a little bit that people start thinking. Hmm. And of course, your cliffhangers have to come at the end of the story. Don't leave your story open with a cliffhanger that the writers, the readers there going, oh, I want to know. I have to wait until the next book. Nah. So we have a question from Aisha here. No, oh yes, from Aisha here. She's asking, how can I come up with creative ideas? Oh, now that is an extremely difficult question to answer, but thank you. Um, I can only really talk for myself. I never knew I had creative ideas in me. They just came out. And the more I sat and thought and planned, the more came out. And today, more and more and more is coming out. I've, I've got like a machine inside me of creative ideas. Um, for me, as I said earlier, um, I have to go outside into the countryside, be by myself. I need some space around me. But I think every person has to find their own space and find their own area of getting ideas. Um, you basically write everything down, everything at all. It doesn't matter how silly it is. Just write any idea. Even if you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and oh, I've had an idea, write it down quickly and then come back to it. And then try to put it together afterwards. Yes, that's a good advice. Okay, Sarah Janetje said she's from Lahore and she says thank you to you. Ah, well, my fa says, fa the favorite food of I've ever eaten in Pakistan was actually next to Bajahi Mosque and it was a Lahori Murgi Handi. And it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> sure, give, you're giving us good advice. We can go there and have it too. Yes. And Zara is saying, how to write an interesting story? Um, again, it all... Ooh, now that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, an interesting story. It, well, it depends who's reading the story. Everybody has different tastes. Some people like fantasy. Some people like fiction, nonfiction. Um, you have to write, firstly, for yourself, what comes out of you. So it's what, what interests you. And... and Hopefully, then, with your style of writing and your ideas, other people will like it as well. You certainly need, I would say, a good idea. And that's why the thinking phase and the planning phases are, for me, so important. The, write, the physical writing is what I do at the very end. But for me, the physical writing is maybe one quarter of it. The, the three quarters before, the time and the space and making notes and changing things, that's the story. So do you write, it, do you write by hand? I do, yes. Um, Why? Because now everybody is writing on the laptop. Yeah. When I started writing, I started writing by hand because I felt like it, and I thought it's just nicer. Then I changed to my computer and decided I didn't like it, and then I went back to hand again. When I went to Thailand to write book number two, I was fully prepared when I went there. I had all of my notes ready in the correct order, like a film script, and I started writing. And for me, what... When I speak to you like this now, I'm not thinking about what I say. It just comes out. And when I write by hand, I have exactly the same feeling. I can just write. And if you, this is another good tip to everybody, and maybe I can answer some of the earlier questions. If you want to make your writing authentic, try doing it by hand. Write as you think, especially as I did when I wrote a lot of my book in the first person as a narrative. Um, it's much more authentic because it really feels like somebody is speaking. And I think 
Well, for me, it didn't work. If I do it on a computer, it's too mechanical. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you have to cl stick close to nature. I think writing makes you think from your brain. Exactly that, yes. It, but it's something you can practice. Yes. Now, Sarah Dunet say, wait, please do come again. We'll take you for Mohi Hadi again. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Aisha West is saying, what difference do you feel by writing by hand and typing? Okay. Um, typing for me is much more mechanical. I can't express myself uh, very well by write, by typing. Maybe because I don't type that well these days. I used to use all of my fingers and now maybe thumbs. Um, when I write by hand, it's quick and it's exactly how I think. And I try when I then type it afterwards to keep as much as I can to my original handwritten work. And quite a few people have said to me that they like my writing style because they have the feeling that Nick Ponter is actually speaking to them. And I think I could only achieve that by writing by hand. Okay, now let's move on to our next reading part. I like this one. This is my favorite. Yes, we, we love your reading. <laughs> Thank you. So, all good stories need characters. And in my book, I've got, I can't describe all characters today, but I'm now going to describe Felicity Forsyth Twyke. I had a lot of fun thinking of names for this story. Jemima Kingston and a dog called Cromwell. Now, as you may have noticed, I'm a man and the two people I'm now going to read are women. So I'm going to do my best at doing women's voices. Oh, it just says how divine, squawked Felicity Forsyth Twyke. Since when have you had this little darling? She added in a high-pitched voice. Oh, what's its name? This Felicity is Cromwell, replied Jemima Kingston. I've only had him since last week. It was rather strange. The doorbell rang on Thursday last week and I found Cromwell just sitting on my doorstep, looking up at me. Nobody else was there and also there was no note, just a dot collar with the name Cromwell on it. Really? Felicity Forsyth Twyke replied slowly and somehow sheepishly, but didn't look surprised when she said it. She coughed, <coughs> composed herself and carried on. One just doesn't abandon a dog on one's doorstep. Surely someone from that rabble at Lower Molehampton, she added haughtily. We from Upper Molehampton just wouldn't do anything like that. How could anyone? He's just so delightful. I love dogs. Our family has always had dogs. I'm sure you know it's a toy fox terrier, she said with the aloof authority of a schoolmistress. In fact, I just love all animals. Have you got anything to do with this, Felicity? You reacted as though you have a hand in it. Oh, Jemima, shame on you to utter such a thing. Of course not. And anyway, Felicity, it's a chihuahua, retorted Jemima smugly. Oh, <laughs> I knew that. You know, they are very similar. Felicity Forsyth Twyke now sounded a little defensive. Jemima looked at her with delight. And what's more, he's so cute I can carry him in my handbag and even take him to work. Jemima, dear, why the devil would you want him to take to that dreadful, ghastly place? It's full of bland and boring civil servants. Oh, darling Felicity, I'm the manager of this place, believe me. It's not all that dreadful and ghastly. Oh, so the rumours are true then. It's more than just a government office. Ah, Felicity, I wish you would stop listening to rumours. All we do is routine office work. Nothing sinister as a lot of people imagine, Jemima said abruptly. And how is your business going, darling? Jemima was eager to change this unpleasant subject rather quickly. Animal lover, you said. Oh, absolutely. You know, I love animals. This meat industry is good for my pocket, and at least the animals have a purpose in their lives, Felicity added cruelly. And what purpose may that be exactly, said Jemima, urgently wanting to know. Felicity frowned and looked serious. To make us happy, of course. Summer barbecues followed by the fattening up for Christmas. Peak time, Jemima dear. People just want to eat meat. More and more of it these days, and so they should. Eat and don't ask is my motto. Whew. That is the end of one of my favourite scenes. So, I hope I did women's voices okay, but now after all of that effort, I need a drink. Oh, 
we, we should show it to you on the screen. I'm glad you still have it. I have six of them. Six of them. Really, because we are the most destructive family, we would break our glasses away. <laughs> <laughs> and how many years is, it has been? Since I was there, I left in 2003, so 17 years now. And I'm delighted to be back, even though it's only virtual. Wow, 17 years and you still have these glasses. I do, yes. I have lots of pictures in the house from my time there as well. Nice time. Very good memories. That's Very good. good. That's good. That's good. Okay, now we have a question from Zara. That uh, what? Tell me which topic should we write? Oh, I can't answer that question. I don't know what's inside you. <laughs> I really don't know what's inside you. Yes, uh, we have a question from Maida. She's asking me that um, her son wants to write stories about mon monsters. No boy. Okay. He's from how old is How old is he then? Grade three, um, seven, six, seven? Uh, no, it would be nine or eight. No, okay. Monster story. Well, monsters are generally scary. That's what we think. But do monsters have to be scary? Surely monsters can also be funny. Why don't you do something different and write a funny monster story where maybe the monster is sweet? and scares people because people think that monsters are scary but actually they're not maybe so twist the story around because i'm not sure as a, maybe an eight or nine year old if you would want to write something scary maybe you would want people of your age group to read it and make it actually quite funny maybe you're in the story that's a good idea you know i like i like your reading style the fel felicity she sounded quite naughty <laughs> she's even better in book number two she's even better yeah and her um, this uh, oh how divine is in all my stories <laughs> it's her trademark <laughs> okay we have a question here do you like being an author i love it yeah it's it's still quite new for me my book only came out in november last year um, i loved writing it and i think you can probably feel that and, and hear it um, and it, one of the coolest feelings in my life was to have this in my hand for the first time and touch it and see my name on it and go to a bookshop and see it in the bookshop. And say, That's me. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I, I said, yesterday. I, sorry. Yes. Yes, please, please go on. I said, yesterday I helped a friend move house and we, we were moving the books. And guess what I found in the pile of books? So. Ikra, sorry. Uh, I think um, our internet got connected, or I don't know what happened. We couldn't hear. No, you froze a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I can see. Oh, oh, so I'll say it again. Yeah, I helped a friend move house yesterday, and we were moving the books, and I found this whilst oh, I was moving the books. Cool. That, that was also a cool feeling. Yes, I'm sure. So we have a question from How can we use good vocabulary? That is a question I was really glad to get. Read, 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 and read. The more you read, the more vocabulary you get. Sim easy to answer. Just read. I think this is for all of the students out there who want to read and write. Okay, we have another question from Wali Bajan. Uh, he's saying, can you tell me how to make stories interesting? Yeah, this is a little bit like the story with suspense. Uh, give the writer something new. For example, my story is fantasy, the Molehamptons, and I've, I've got another little reading coming up in a minute, and that's something new. Um, it depends if you, let, let's say you want to write fantasy, give them something new. Um, I don't want to be too critical, but at the moment there are lots of dragons and dwarfs and things like that in books. I think people have maybe had enough of dragons and dwarfs now. I think it's been written about enough. Come up with a new idea, Wally. Come up with something fresh. Um, and you don't. it doesn't have to happen overnight. It can take you a year. But try to think of something new and refreshing because you must have read books and or you do read books. Try not to write something which you've already read. OK, and I think that will make people interesting is when they pick up a book and say, wow, this is different. This is new. I think, yes, quite true. OK, now can we move on to our next reading part? We certainly can. This now it's real fantasy. We can't wait. 
Yeah, I just need to find my page. Ah, here we go. So the next scene I'm going to read to you is the fantasy part of the story. Connor Jackson is now below the ground in the world of moles. And if you think that they're just tunnels and dirt and mud, then you're quite wrong. Below the ground, you have shops and restaurants and dog salons and offices and jobs and warehouses. There's everything below the ground. And when they're below the ground as well, they have to move around. This is the story of Connor Jackson with his first experience of the transport shuttle. First, there was a rattling noise, followed by a whooshing sound, which announced our transport shuttle. It sounded just like a train arriving in an underground station. The noise was getting louder as the shuttle approached, and in the distance I could now make out some lights, which were erratically zipping down the tunnel, as the shuttle was obviously moving at great speed. I stared in awe at a transparent plastic tube sliding to a dusty stop in front of us, like an aeroplane sliding along on its undercarriage. The tube had red plastic caps screwed to both ends, which looked exactly like the plastic tubes we used at work for our pneumatic postal system in the building. I remember that a few of them went missing a while ago. Hmm. The cap at the front had a large round hole cut into it, and a dirty dust-covered mole with a flying cap and goggles sitting in the seat behind it. The mole wiped the dirt from his goggles and shouted, this is line number four to the arrivals hall. Come on, jump in. We haven't got all day, you know. Sid moved forward and opened a hinged door upwards, allowing access to three rows of two seats. I sat in the seat right next to him in the first row as he beckoned me to do so. The driver turned around, looked at me and said, Come on, shut the door. It doesn't shut by itself, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I mumbled and pulled down a handle at the top of the door. The door closed and the driver turned around again and said, Gentlemen, remember the health and safety rules down here. Put your seatbelt on and also wear the helmet under your seat. Sid, you know the rules, so make sure your newbie does what he's told. I don't want any injuries today. Only yesterday we had an injury because a chicken refused to wear the helmet and cut his head on the ceiling. <sighs> Unbelievable how much time I wasted on the injury report for the authorities. I've really got better things to do. I was lucky to get away with just a reprimand. Sid showed me how to put on my safety belt. Well, actually, I wouldn't call it a safety belt. It was more like a piece of garden rope. Neither would I call the seat a seat, as it seemed to be cut out of a flower pot. And the helmet, well, if you ask me, it looked like the metal top of a bottle. In fact, as I looked around, everything seemed to be made of trash from my human world. Strange. Hold on, Connor. This is going to be a bumpy ride. The driver adjusted his goggles, then pressed a button in the cockpit. I was just wondering how the strange contraption worked when a transparent hose above my head, which went from the cockpit to the back of the tube, started shaking and fizzing. I turned around and saw a spark coming out of the end of a cable, igniting some sort of fluid in a container. Then the transport tube started shaking wildly, and with a puff, and an explosion as the fluid ignited fully. The driver released a lever and the tube lurched forwards into the darkness, getting faster and faster, bouncing off the top, the bottom and the side of the tunnel. I was holding onto my seat with all of my strength as the tube shot down the tunnel at breakneck speed, careering off the round walls. It felt like being in a food mixer and my stomach was churning as my nails dug into my seat and the safety belt bore into my sides. I had absolutely no idea how far we had travelled, or how long, and I was very happy that I used this bottle top helmet as my head was heavily smashed against the top of the tube. Hold on! Landing in a few minutes! shouted the driver above the din of the noise. So Ikra, back to Television H headquarters in Karachi. So we have a, something you have Something to say? Chicken wearing a helmet is very funny. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you say that again, please? A chicken wearing a helmet is very funny. I think so. Well, down below, underneath the ground, in the world of moles, this is the fantasy part of the story. 
All animals are down there, and they're all the same size, and they can all speak to each other. And did you know, at night time, when we're all asleep, they come out above the surface and steal everything they need for below the ground, which is why they had flower pots and things. <laughs> That's really funny. Okay. Uh, Madiha Sambal is asking, should we use simple language or long, complicated sentences? Excellent question. It depends who you're writing to and what the scene is. Let's say, for example, you're writing a descriptive scene. Maybe your sentences can be a little longer. If you're writing dialogue, then your dialogue should be authentic. And it's perfectly okay when you write a dialogue to use short, snappy sentences, like I'm speaking now. And if you write by hand, you would know what I'm talking about. So you can do both. And here is a question from Shagufta Faru. She's asking, how long have you been an author? I suppose technically it depends when I started writing. So. I started writing my book seven years ago, so I could say seven years ago. My book was published in November last year. So I've been an author for seven years. I've been a published author for one year. And published, uh, thank you very much to Pegasus for letting me publish. Rudita from the from Pegasus is actually watching today. Hello, Rudita. Hello to you, Rudita. Okay, now uh, Aisha Aves is asking, which writer are you inspired by? Which author's writing style do you follow? Okay, I can easily answer that question. Um, when I was a child or teenager, I loved reading Roald Dahl. And I loved his writing style because he wrote, not always, but the stories I liked, he wrote fantasy stories, which were funny, fantasy, but not scary. There were no swear words. There was nothing to make children scared in it. So for me, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or James and the Giant Peach are two of the most amazing stories written. Um, I can't say I copied or his style. All I can say is that I loved his style and maybe some of that rubbed off on me. Uh, I wouldn't say I purposefully tried to copy his style. That, that wouldn't be true. Um, I, I certainly wrote in my style, but I, I loved what he did. Roald Dahl, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, amazing story. Yes, it um, is. I love Roald Dahl too. He's brilliant, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my favorite book is the BFG. Isn't it a big monster? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Very good story. <laughs> oh, is J.K. Rowling your favorite author? Um, I, I have read the Harry Potter stories, and I think they're absolutely wonderful. I, I don't think I've got a favorite author because authors write different things for different people. So. Certainly, J.K. Rowling came up with the most amazing story based on school years. And as somebody said a question a while ago, how to make a story interesting, write something new. And J.K. Rowling certainly did that, certainly. Roald Dahl is ultimate. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't have a particular favourite. Uh, but I, I have more than one. I like music. I like more than one music band. Yes. <laughs> so Wonderful. Favorite is Roald Dahl, and so is yours. Okay, now we have something. What do you like most, being an author or being a teacher? I like both because I get pleasure out of different things. I get pleasure writing, and especially now, one year after my book is out, there's nothing which gives me more pleasure than to sit here now reading and inspiring to you. And that is an amazing feeling. So being an author is not just writing. It's everything else which comes with it as well. Being a teacher, I teach English, um, but I teach business English. I don't teach literature. And I love going into companies and helping people do their jobs. And it's really nice that people leave and say, oh, Nick, thank you for helping me today. So I, I like both jobs equally, and they're both very different. Okay, let's. Uh, I think let's move on to our next reading part. And the last yes. reading part. And the last reading part, yes. But bef before you put me on to solo... Um, a question for you, Ikra. When you do your laundry at home and you put your socks in the washing machine, do you get all of your socks back? No. Exactly. I don't know. Exactly. There is a problem. One is always missing. Exactly. The moles. Uh, <laughs> the next scene describes socks. Really? Okay, everybody, this is now the last reading part for today. As I just said, for all of the parents there who like to do their laundry and always wonder where the missing socks go, this will help explain it. The moles have got something to do with it. 
it's not going to help you get them back. So page 190. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. I wanted that look a little strange. So here we go. Wind and buffeting rain didn't make his evening any better. He looked miserable and was miserable as he sat down on the bench. Sergeant Dawson walked, not in a particularly straight line, from the Anchor Inn in Lower Molehampton and decided to take a rest on his way home in the village green, which was actually very close to the pub. His week had been bad, really bad. From a well-respected local policeman to an utter incompetent fool in one week was no mean feat, and he had managed it with flying colours. His career and reputation were in ruins, and more importantly, his quiet life was over. He sat down with a slightly sozzled expression on his face and just stared at the ground. Maybe the wind had blown the litter right in front of his feet. The weather had been very bad lately. Sergeant Dawson looked up at the wind moving the branches and then fixed his gaze back to the ground. But there was nothing. From the corner of his eye, he saw that the rubbish had moved from the left of the bench to the right. A sock. No, four socks. He counted them carefully and slowly again and tried to focus on what he was looking at. The socks were open and filled with things which looked like a hairbrush and a pair of scissors. Why? He was confused, quite rightly. It was, in fact, not 100% sober, but he was sure that these objects were moving. Sergeant Dawson may not have been the quickest of cats, but he knew when something was out of place. Stop it! He said out loud to himself or anyone else who might be listening. I might have had a few drinks, but I can see you very clearly. Stop! He looked sharply to the left and gazed in that direction for a moment and then quickly turned his head back to the right and to look where the socks were now. They were gone. He stood up and walked to the last place he saw them, stooped over and inspected the ground. Ah, there they were. Stand still, he shouted again and staggered towards the socks. Stop moving! He looked up at the trees and then back down at the ground. They had moved again, up, down, up. They moved each time he didn't look. Not much, but enough for him to notice. They were now in a line about 10 metres in front of him. Stand still, who are you? Sergeant Dawson was now screaming at the socks. Been drinking, Sergeant? Came a voice from behind the bushes. Uh, what? replied the Sergeant. Been drinking, I asked. You're making too much noise. It's after closing time, and especially you should know better than shouting around in the middle of the night. Who's there? asked Sergeant Dawson, squinting towards the streetlight. It's me, Mr. Rye. What are you doing here? Looking for my dog, remember? My loyal Ludwig went missing about a week ago. Never seen him since. Very strange, I must say. Sorry about that, but we really don't have the resources now. With Mr. Jackson and the Forsyth Twite girl disappearing... You can't imagine how much pressure I'm getting from her mother. Yes, as a matter of fact, but what are you doing here? And, Sergeant, who are you talking to? To the pair of scissors and to the hairbrush. They're moving over there. Mm, been a hard week, I know. Mr. Rye looked at Sergeant Dawson pitifully. You could say that, but they are moving. Who is moving? Mr. Rye asked suspiciously. The scissors, the brush and the socks, of course. OK, I really should take you home and let your wife take care of you, said Mr. Rye softly. You don't believe me? Look for yourself, insisted Sergeant Dawson and pointed to the ground. Look at what? Well, the socks over there. But there's nothing to see. Sergeant Dawson's head darted towards the ground to the left and then to the right. Oh, where are you? His voice was panic fueled now. Come on, where are you? He stumbled across to the bench slumped down with a disenchanted face and stared at the ground with his head in his hands. And that is my reading plan for today, Ikora. Back to television headquarters. So, Nick, uh, some Aisha is asking you, can she get you a signed book? I'm sure we can work out a way of getting it to Pakistan. Yes. I think I want that one too. Um, we, we will have to talk the logistics of how to get it, but I'm sure we can do that. Sure, let's plan it. Okay, now uh, we have, uh, even from Wali Wajit, he's also saying that he wants your signed book. What I'll do, when, when we finish this reading, I will t uh, chat with Ikra, and I'm sure we will come up with a plan of getting some books out to Pakistan signed. Perfect, perfect. 
And here, Shagufta is also saying that she will buy your book. Thank you. Favorite author. Thank you. And um, Aisha. But by the way, my, my book is also available as an ebook, as a Kindle download. Obviously, I can't sign that. Um, <laughs> but and it's also available as an audio book, which I narrated myself. You are a good narrator. I can hear it, and you, you love your book. I can hear it in your reading. <laughs> and uh, here is Aisha. She's asking. Uh, she's saying, whenever I start brainstorming for creative writing or story writing, I feel bored. How to overcome that? Mm. I know the feeling because for many times I sat there looking at a wall and I tried to force myself into thinking of something. And do you know what? When you force yourself, nothing happens. You, the best ideas come when you least expect them. And that's why have a notebook with you all the time or your smartphone and speak into it and make a recording. The best ideas come when you don't expect them. Don't put yourself under pressure. OK, but one thing which I found when my when my ideas started and one led to another and to another it may be a while to, to have a few things have a general concept in other words the world of moles is the general concept then make up some characters and then the more you add to it like lego bricks the, don't force yourself and if you get frustrated stop and wait for it to come naturally okay now, here is a question from Sarah Junaid. My daughter, Michelle, oh. missed something about powerful adjectives. Okay, let me see. Uh, I missed that, sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, really. Can you say that again, please? Uh, can you send that message again? And here is a question from Sidra Parvez. Is brainstorming necessary before writing? Um, for me, definitely. I never would have been able to write the story without brainstorming. Everybody's different. I, I doubt very much J.K. Rowling sat down and just wrote her story without planning it. Uh, I, I mean, maybe some people can. Uh, I can't. I have to really brainstorm. And I'm glad I do, because I never would have thought of this without brainstorming. Yes. Here is Shekhovta. She's saying, wow. OK, uh, Nick, can you tell me a little about uh, uh, when do you think it's the best time to write? Do you go to any special place? Like you said, that you go outside. So yeah. which is your favorite spot? My favorite spot to write is a place in Germany, and it's the River Weser. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the story of the uh, the Pied Piper of Hamelin. Have, I don't, yeah, okay, you're nodding your head. Well, that river is where I wrote most of my story. V very close to where the Pied Piper of Hamelin was actually um, where it happens, or meant to have happened. So uh, for me, um, I need time. For example, with the, the thinking phase and the planning phase, I do that when I'm walking around and things. To physically write, I have to go away for a week, 10 days, and all I do is write, and I go away by myself with my book, and I sit there and write and write and write and write and write. Last year, I went to Thailand, and in nine days, I wrote 250 pages of A4 by hand in nine days but without brainstorming and planning it wouldn't have happened Truly. okay uh, so Sarah Janet is asking we should use powerful adjective to make the story more interesting y yeah um, I think you have to use your adjectives carefully I don't think you should overuse adjectives certainly when people are in dialogue you don't really need adjectives of course an adjective is to give more description um, so when, for example, you have, for example, the, the transport shuttle scene, when Connor Jackson was standing, waiting, there I use powerful adjectives because that's the, where you need them. But when, for example, you have Felicity Forsyth Twike speaking to Jemima and saying, oh, how divine, then I would say in dialogue, maybe you don't need so much. So use them carefully and use them in the right place. Okay, here is uh, Bali Wajit. He's saying whenever I... Brainstorm, I get bored. I think uh, you have already answered it. Um, I, I'll, I'll write it again then. then Wally, you need to maybe rethink about where your best place is to do it. Um, maybe you need a little bit more time. Um, everybody's different, so I can't really say. 
Um, I don't know how you relax. I, I also like listening to music and I can have music in the background. And for me, that relaxes me. Um, everybody's different. So I can't really say that. But if you're frustrated and you're bored, stop. Because the best ideas come when you least expect it. So Nick, I think uh, this is it for today. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a lovely time and we love your reading. I would be delighted to come back and do more for you if you like. And I am pretty sure now where my socks are gone now. <laughs> Wherever they are, one sock is always missing. Now we know. There was, a, there was a question from the Flippity Sisters, but I didn't hear it. Yes, yes, we please. Loved, we loved your reading session. Thank you very much. And I love your YouTube videos. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> we all love them. Safe. Your reading session was very interesting. Thank you very much. And the way you read, I I can see it that you love your book. I do. Yes. So here oh. is. Um, oh, here's a question. Like, like the word "big," we should not use the word "big." We should use the word "massive." Um, I think you can use both words. If you want to describe that something is big or large, don't use the word "big" all the time. If you use the word massive all the time and you use it 20 times in the book, people will notice. So there's nothing wrong with using short words. It doesn't make you clever because you have a long word. Use a good mixture of words, I would say. Here is Aisha, Emil. Should we use longer sentences or smaller? Again, it depends on what you want to do. If you're writing a dialogue between people like... Jemima Kingston, Felicity Forsyth Twyk, I wrote that nice and sh short and sharp because that was what they were doing. They were having a good conversation, so short and sharp. When I write descriptive scenes, for example, about the Mall Hamptons, then I use longer sentences. So again, it depends on what your purpose is. Again, writing a long sentence doesn't necessarily make your writing always good. It has to fit to what you want to say. Yes. This was a nice story. From thank you. Sarah and and thank you so much for the answers from Aisha. And You're Sarah welcome. Is thanking you as well. So thank you, thank you so much, Nick, for being here. Thank you everyone for watching and for participating with your questions. Thanks a lot. Here it was a go. pleasure. Bye. Thank you so much, Bye. Nick. Thanks Bye. again. You're Bye -bye. welcome. Bye.